Lecture 25, Reliability and Fail-Soft Operation. So except in the very recent discussion about hard drives may die, uh, and if you recall from EC252, the discussion of the Byzantine Generals problem, we usually go through life assuming that computer systems will work as they are intended. That does not rule out the possibility uh, of a design problem or uh, an implementation bug, right? Those sorts of things certainly happen, um, and quite honestly, they happen more than we would probably like, right? Uh, in many expectations, we have surprisingly low expectations of computer systems. Things crash, you just reboot them, you know? Hello IT, have you tried turning it off and on again? All right, uh, operation failed for some reason. You know, why don't we just try the operation again? You know, uh, maybe it'll work next time. All right, um, that's kind of weird because I mean we talked about in um, concurrency control, right? The the need to make it so that well your program works correctly every time. Uh, but for a sufficiently complex program, we know that that probably doesn't actually happen because it's fairly difficult as an undertaking. Um, and I said, would you buy a calculator that only gave you the correct answer 99% of the time? Uh, and most people, I think, put their hand up and say, no, they wouldn't. You know, they would like a calculator that they know to be reliable. Um, but realistically, if you had one that you knew was you know, only going to get it right the majority of the time, but not always, you would probably double check a lot of your calculations, wouldn't you? So. Um, our expectations as computer systems are to some extent very low um, because yeah we expect that there will be bugs and we expect that things will go wrong and um, I mean, we're we're not disappointed when they do if we expect that things will go wrong let's say that um, now sometimes um, when we're talking about these sorts of systems we have to consider how important is um, reliability is it actually required? Um, and downtime is sometimes okay to fix a problem, um, whether it's by fixing the system or simply replacing it. If, for example, my laptop should go for an unplanned swim in a lake, it's out of action and probably permanently, right? I doubt very much there's any coming back from that sort of thing. I can just buy a new laptop, right? Um, I mean, I, I don't want to. I'm happy with the computers I have, and I, I don't want to go out of my way, and I'm certainly not going to arrange for an accident where my uh, laptop goes for a swim, uh, just so I can somehow have a reason to get a new one. That, that doesn't make sense. Um, but nevertheless, um, whatever I choose, even if it can be repaired, there's going to be some downtime, because between the time when my laptop goes for the swim and the time that its replacement arrives, I imagine it's not fixable, so um, the replacement arrives, I don't have that laptop. Okay, um, I'm probably not happy, but um, my laptop makes no promises of uptime. Right? In a less dramatic scenario, uh, one in which you know, I still have the laptop at the end of the story, um, imagine I'm installing a software update. Um, there is a, a big operating system update um, and you know, the estimated time to install this is measured in minutes, maybe an hour. That's downtime, right? I can't really use the laptop during the installation process because I'm just getting you know, a loading screen where it tells me that it's um, working on it and uh, it will continue to work on it until such time as the, um, as the update is finished. Um, and I may have other computers um, where I may be able to do work on my phone, in which case it doesn't really matter if there is that sort of downtime. Um, and that's okay, right? Um, the operating system maybe gives me even a guess for how long it's going to take. You know, the update is expected to complete within X minutes, and while you're doing it, it says uh, it's running and you know, re remaining time is this. Um, but those are not promises, right? If I need a system where that doesn't happen, um, then we have to talk about things like reliability, right? Even when hardware or software update is required, maybe downtime in that situation is intolerable, right? Um, we can't have downtime in you know, a life or safety critical system because it's installing an update, at least not while the system is supposed to be in operation. Right? Um, maybe you, know, you can do other things. Um, maybe there's uh, opportunities where 
Um, it's okay for the system to be offline if it's you know, some automated controller in a car manufacturing plant. Like, you know, hey, if the workers of the plant are on strike, this is a good time to install updates on the control software. But for the most part, um, you know, other life and safety critical systems, you can't just turn off because um, you need them. Um, so reliability is important um, for this kind of system, particularly in the life and safety critical, but also sometimes if you have a service level agreement uh, where you promise the responses will be returned within some time, there's usually financial penalties if for some reason you fail to meet the uh, agreement. Uh, and so if our responses are delayed because while well, we were installing a software update, um, no one dies, but it does cost money, uh, and that's not what you want, right? You, you don't want to you know, violate the SLA because, I mean, yeah, it costs money, but it also you know, decreases the trust that your customers have. Um, you are actually able to deliver on your promises, um, and that's maybe more damaging than the monetary component of it. It really depends. Okay, so here's, um, here's an example. And if I'm um, you know, traveling to work via a car and I get a flat tire, the car's out of action while the tire gets changed. All right, changing a tire is not an extraordinarily difficult operation. It can be done, but it takes non-zero time uh, and so uh, inevitably delays my travels to work, All right? Um, so that's fine. Um, uh, but after that, I can go on. Now that's a uh, repair, and the repair has downtime. And the downtime in that example is you know, they're ambled off uh, you know, into the parking lot or on the side of the road, um, and I am changing the tire to the spare tire because, well, that's what needs doing, but I'm not making any forward progress in that time because, yeah, the car is at a stop. Okay. On the other hand, um, some cars have these run-flat tires, um, and the slide even shows you a little diagram of how run-flat tires work um, in a technical sense. Um, and the, the run-flat tire has some support ring built into it um, so that you know, if there's no air in the tire, well, you can still run it on uh, what you've got. Um, and this usually comes with limitations. And the limitations are like there's a you know, maximum number of kilometers you can travel with it. Um, similarly, um, there's usually limitations on the speed, so I wouldn't describe them as being very suitable for highway driving, but they could get you to you know, your destination. It could get you to a car dealership, repair facility, um, something like that. Uh, so you're not left stuck on the side of the road trying to change the tire. So um, what we would say in this situation is that the car is able to continue functioning but at reduced capacity. So with the with the run flat tire, right, like the capacity is reduced because now I can only travel a maximum 50 kilometers an hour, let's say, um, and all right, maybe that's slower than, you know, the 60 or 80 kilometers an hour for the road that I'm traveling on, but the car is still making progress and, you know, I can take it to the shop and it can get worked on there. Uh, and it, at no time am I actually stopped on the side of the road uh, with the uh, impact wrench trying to change a tire. Okay, so that's the kind of thing we would like for um, our system if we want to talk about fail soft operations. Um, the idea that if something goes wrong, we can carry on at reduced capacity such that we're not totally dead in the water. Now, there are two distinct goals that I mentioned there, and I, I think we should be clear that they are not really the same thing. So one of them is resiliency uh, and the other is, is fail soft. Um, so resiliency is based around the idea of the system is capable of carrying on even in the uh, event of a failure, even if it's not at full capacity. Um, and fail soft operation says that if things do indeed fail, then the system try to preserve as much capability as possible um, or it will terminate gracefully if it must. If there's no way to go on, uh, and it just makes sense to stop what we're doing entirely, well, then that's what we will have to do. Okay, so in the previous topic, where we talked about RAID, we discussed what we could do when something goes wrong. Where does it fall in this spectrum? Well, if nothing else, the conversation about RAID 
taught us the important lesson that there's no such thing as like totally ironclad devices that you are certain are going to last a hundred years um, and nothing will go wrong. Um, if you want there to be a system that can take some failures, the real route to getting there is through redundancy. Um, and that is if you need to be able to carry on even if a hard drive dies, well, you should have more than one hard drive in the system. Uh, and that actually applies to other things as well, like CPU. Um, why not, right? If you want to be able to survive the death of a CPU, well, we need to have more than one CPU in the system. Okay, so in the famous words of Rocky Balboa, who, and I'm not going to try to do this Stallone impression. I mean, the Arnold ones are, are fine, um, but uh, I, I don't think I have the the right one for Stallone, um, where he says, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. So in designing a system for resiliency, the real question is how much resiliency do you really need? We looked into that a little bit in the previous topic talking about RAID, and it's like, well, how many spare drives do you want to have? Um, more spare drives means you can handle you know, more things going wrong, um, but it also comes with a cost, uh, and the cost is perhaps you know, less um, capacity or, or more money. But, yeah, um, one thing that sort of helps us to think clearly about the resiliency requirements is based around what are the consequences if the system is down, right? Um, you know, is this the, you know, did we lose money situation uh, when there's system downtime or is it people might die when there's system downtime? Because your considerations are very, very different, right? You know, you're making something that's for uh, running a um, uh, life support system in a hospital, like downtime results in patients dying, so it is completely unacceptable uh, and we can't have that. But you, know, you have a banking app, um, and you know, the banking app is down. Yeah, okay, maybe we don't make some money because people wanted to you know, do transactions or, or do something, uh, and right now they can't. But it's, it's not on the same level of consequences uh, as a life or death situation. So um, we should also remember, incidentally, that there are some scenarios that you cannot and should not handle because they're either like too outlandish uh, or just plain apocalyptic, right? Um, if Russia is going to launch its nuclear missiles, assuming any of them actually work, um, and your data center is in one of the target zones, does it matter if your app is gonna have some downtime right now? Um, you know, as, uh, as Sarah Connor says, anybody not wearing two million sunblock is gonna have a real bad day. So um, yeah, you know, August 29th, 1997, 2.14 Eastern time. Um, there's situations where like, listen, you can have as much redundancy as you want, but there's no sense in like having so much redundancy that you've prepared for the end of the world, All right? Nevertheless, we have an engineering trade-off here between the cost and the amount of resiliency that you want to have. Um, and up to a certain point, more money gets you more redundancy and more resiliency. And not too long ago, we talked about the idea uh, of um, air travel, right? Um, and I, I mean, I was feeling, I suppose at the time that I wrote this originally, a little bit aggrieved with a particular airline in question, who's, uh, it was appearing on the board here. Um, no, no points for guessing which one it is, but I think we all know which one it is. Um, because you know, every flight I took last year uh, was delayed an hour except one uh, and then the one that wasn't delayed was like on the way back from a vacation um, so yeah that's that's how that's going um, but yeah we discussed the example that was based around the thinking of how much extra crew capacity do we need Right, um, A lack of spare crew capacity results in delaying your flight from Calgary to Vancouver because it's snowing in Nova Scotia because, well, you see you know, multiple pieces sort of need to move around the board to make sure the right planes with the right people are in the you know, location of your departure at the correct time. Uh, and if something goes wrong because of uh, whatever reason, then this has a cascade effect uh, and it ends up propagating to you know, many 
unrelated areas, right? We said also that, um, well, if they wanted to, right, um, you know, said airline could make the system more resilient by spending more money, right? A snowstorm in Nova Scotia wouldn't rule the travel plans of unrelated people several thousand kilometers away. Um, but we also said that that's got limits because at the other end of the spectrum, the airline can't spend, you know, tons and tons of money uh, just keeping crews sitting around doing nothing just in case. Uh, there has to necessarily be some sort of trade-off there. Okay, so let's imagine, with some preamble about this sort of already out of the way, that something actually goes wrong. All right? um, there are a few different ways that we can respond or handle this situation. Um, and for the sake of the example, we will talk about hardware failures usually, but you could imagine software failures as well. Um, the important thing is not this very specific failure that occurs, um, it's just you know, making sure that we think about the options in the right way. So option one, can we fix it? Yes, we can. Uh, and the best option for resiliency, if we can get it, is if the system can correct the problem and carry on. This may not be possible if we're talking about an unrecoverable hardware failure, if the magic smoke has come out of the hard drive, no amount of rebooting will make the smoke go back in again, right? Um, but other kinds of problems are um, transient um, or other problems are um, fixed by rebooting it. So if we can fix it, we can fix it. Uh, and when we fix it, we can go on and that kind of makes our life happy again, so to speak, right? If the failure is solved by reinitializing the device, go for it. Um, deadlock detection and recovery is potentially an example of this, right? That is a software problem. Um, and we talked in a previous course, um, uh, what do we keep mentioning in this, in this one, um, about deadlock recovery. Um, and deadlock is a failure. And we spent significant time talking about the potential options for recovering from that failure. Uh, and you know, kill processes, reboot the system, you know, implement a rollback, something like that. Um, all these things were presented as options for how we could recover from the failure. And if we do so, then great, you know, everything can carry on. Um, we know from the, the discussion of um, the deadlock uh, recovery strategies that they're not always clean and pretty, um, but sometimes they do solve the problem. So that would be okay. Um, during the process of recovery though, the system is probably running at a reduced capacity, right? We are not able to um, you know, use all of the uh, resources while something is temporarily offline, uh, or we need to um, kill a bunch of processes and restart them so that our processing capacity is reduced temporarily while we figure it out. It happens. So option two, stiff upper lip, uh, or in UK English, keep calm and carry on. And if the system cannot be restored to full capacity automatically, the next best thing is if the system can continue as much as it can, um, most likely at some sort of reduced capacity, right? Suppose the system has four CPU cores, one of them dies, but the CPU was never used at more than 50% capacity when all of the CPU cores were healthy, okay? So the system is worse off, certainly, and its maximum capacity has been reduced, but in practice, the system is able to run at its original capacity, right? That's one reason for redundancy in the system, to be sure, um, and is certainly the ideal case, that we have plenty of room um, such that uh, if one of the CPUs dies, then you know, everything works out okay, because we have just so much extra capacity around. But that's probably not the case. Right. Um, did you actually design the system with that much extra capacity? You may have, um, and that would be actually kind of sensible, um, but suppose you didn't. Okay, um, so what do you do um, when you know, we can't do this? Right? Um, the, next, um, the next thing we would have to consider, um, the system's running at this reduced capacity until you know, some external forces come to repair it, assuming that's possible. But in the meantime, it you know, takes longer to get answers, less work can be done in the same amount of time, and we can't meet all of the deadlines. Okay, 
So what do we do then? Um, so in a real-time system, it is considered stable in the technical definition if um, when we have reduced capacity, it will always meet the deadlines of the most critical tasks, even if some of the lower priority tasks do not get completed. In this sense, it means that you know, painful choices may need to be made, but the most important things will still be prioritized. There does exist a hierarchy of like, this is what's most important, um, and that is respected. Uh, and based on that, um, we make those decisions. And if we have enough capacity still uh, to do all the most critical things, we would say the system is stable. Um, we will consider some other scenarios in a bit um, for handling a problem, um, but then we'll uh, return to the idea of uh, carrying on at reduced capacity. So our third best option to uh, some extent, if we can't repair the problem automatically and we can't carry on at reduced capacity, uh, is to do an orderly shutdown. Um, and uh, perhaps um, we will um, effectively you know, ask things you know, nicely, to, um, nicely to clean up and uh, exit in a well-structured manner. You know, make sure that all file is written to disk uh, and make sure that you know, nothing is left in an inconsistent state. Uh, and maybe that solves at least some of the problem uh, or you know, makes cleanup a little easier. Right. Um, in the traditional Unix system, if it detects um, some sort of corruption of kernel memory, uh, it will write the contents of memory for disk for analysis and it will stop execution. Uh, and if we really can't carry on, then an orderly shutdown is a good way to make sure that we you know, close things out, but also have an opportunity to you know, record some data, make sure we have some analysis information available so that we can in the future um, or you know, some technician can come in, in the future and take a look at the thing uh, and try to figure out what went wrong and why. And the last option is seesaw operation or execution immediately. Uh, if um, we cannot uh, fix the problem, if we don't want to carry on in a reduced state uh, and an orderly shutdown maybe isn't sensible, uh, it may be the case that the best option is in fact to stop immediately. Um, if you know, industrial machinery controller is in a bad state, uh, maybe the best thing to do is actually stop everything so the equipment stops moving uh, and that reduces the risk uh, of injuring somebody. Right. Um, it, it may reduce the potential for damage to materials. Um, it might, uh, the emergency stop may cause some damage, um, but it is most likely preferable to you know, carrying on in a bad state. Uh, and again, downtime for the system is bad, but it's not as bad as the system killing somebody because uh, that is something we definitely want to avoid. Okay, so we'll also talk about faults and fault tolerance. So in this section we've just been through, I've talked about things going wrong and so the definition of things going wrong has been kind of vague as you know, hardware dies or uh, you know, bad things happen, um, but okay, we actually need a definition of a fault and we need a definition of a failure so we can talk realistically about fault tolerance because how do we tolerate faults if we don't have a definition of fault? Right. So let's talk about that. So what is a fault? What is a failure? Um, a failure as defined when we're talking about the context of fault tolerance um, is when the response or the outcome deviates from the specification as the result of an error. Okay, what is an error? An error is a manifestation of a fault. Uh, and what is a fault? Uh, a fault is an erroneous hardware or software state of some variety. Um, this definition is kind of specific to the idea of uh, you know, reliability and fault tolerance. Um, if you ask Grand Admiral Thrawn, um, he will tell you that anyone can make an error, but it does not become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Um, and that's a whole different matter uh, and a whole different way of looking at things. Okay, so given these definitions, right, um, we I think understand the idea that you know, failure is um, you know, we didn't get the outcome that we wanted. Um, an error is um, a manifestation of a fault. Okay, but faults like that definition is too vague. So we need to break it down a little bit. Right. 
Um, the IEEE Standards Dictionary actually gives um, a definition uh, on this. Um, and a permanent fault is one that is always present after it occurs and it can only be fixed by actually replacing or repairing the faulty component. So if you have a GPU and it stops working because it overheats and the overheat causes a failure of its internal components, it is permanently broken and maybe it can be repaired. Um, more likely it needs to be replaced because not too many devices are easily repairable these days, but I, I'm not ruling it out. Um, and if that's the case, we would say this is a permanent fault. Most software bugs um, are also permanent faults. The bug was always in the code, even if it wasn't triggered for some reason, you know, the bug occurs only on the 29th of February. Um, or uh, this uh, is an interaction of two components that didn't use to communicate, but now they do. Um, those sorts of things, they were always there, even if they didn't always activate, even if they weren't always discovered. Um, so software faults are, generally speaking, permanent. Um, all right. Uh, to fix a software bug, what do you do? You make a code change, right? You uh, open a new pull request and uh, builds and you deploy it. Um, you replaced the software system with a slightly different one. It's, uh, you know, uh, that's a good indication actually that it is in fact a permanent fault uh, because you have to build you know, a new release of the software or you know, patch it so that the end state of the software is now different from what it was before uh, to solve the problem that you were having. So yeah, software permanent fault. Um, and then there are intermittent faults. And intermittent faults happen at random unpredictable times. So a faulty chip, um, you know, hardware uh, manufacturing defect um, may produce the right answer most of the time, but the rare uh, occasion it produces a wrong answer, it's kind of hard to predict. So it's difficult to know why and when this happens. Um, and they're super frustrating because it is really hard to track down what's wrong when you have this sort of intermittent fault. It would be easier if it happened reliably, but it doesn't. So, you know, you just gotta sort of take it as it is. And then there are transient faults. Um, and transient faults are ones that occur once, but do not recur. The standard canon example of this is cosmic radiation flipping uh, a random bit from zero to one. Um, but I don't actually know that this is a super great example. Um, Things like satellites, um, particularly the ones that are placed far enough to be outside of Earth's magnetic field, actually have to encounter this problem a lot, right? They need error correcting uh, memory to account for the fact that actually cosmic radiation flips a non-trivial number of bits. Um, and that actually makes it more of an intermittent problem than a transient one, right? It's random when it's going to happen. It's not really in anybody's control. It's hard to predict, but it will happen on a statistical basis at a certain rate. Now, maybe for terrestrial systems, actually cosmic radiation, you know, randomly flipping a bit uh, is a, um, a better, better example of transient fault. Okay, so instead of just jumping right to fault tolerance though, what if we talked about prevention? Because just like deadlock, right? We talked about the idea of, okay, well, um, can we prevent a deadlock from happening? Can we you know, detect it if it happens? Um, but all things being equal, preventing the problem was better than solving it, right? When we, when we prevent the problem, there's no deadlock and you know, everybody's happy. When we solve the deadlock problem, there were frequently um, side effects, right? Like we terminated a process and that meant that the process had to restart um, or you know, some work was lost uh, or extra effort needed to be done, uh, whatever it was there was usually some sort of consequence um, to uh, fixing it after the fact. Whereas if we prevented the problem, it was better. Okay, so, you know, we just have to go back as, uh, as they say, before the software was written and then we can prevent the problem. Okay, so how do we prevent a problem? What strategies do you use I mean, in software, I think we have some pretty good ideas about some of the things that we do to uh, prevent problems. And one of them is testing, right? Uh, how do you stop a bug from shipping into production? Well, what if you were like wrote some tests? 
Um, similarly, uh, you know, there are other tools, you know, code reviews and uh, the like, which could actually you know, prevent a problem uh, from occurring. So yeah, what, what strategies do we use to prevent faults? Well, okay, so there's a few different ideas that we can talk about. Um, and here's, here's a few thoughts. So number one, like make sure that you understand the physical environment, uh, protect the system from physical damage uh, through appropriate shielding, waterproofing, etc. Okay, that's one way to make sure that the system is reliable. If it's gonna be deployed in the field, uh, we would hate for it to be you know, ruined uh, just by a rainfall on its first rainy day out there. So that wouldn't be good, um, but such a thing is uh, you know, preventable. So we could do that. Number two, use hardware with the intended reliability and lifetime. So don't cheap out on the components. Um, and that, uh, I mean, large corporations would love to cheap out on the components anytime they could. Um, but realistically, like if you wanna make the system more reliable, it's gonna cost more money. Uh, buying out cheap components uh, may seem like it saves money, but it might actually be bad in the long term uh, in terms of the reliability of the system. So. We don't want to do that. Um, third point, um, within software development, do we have a sufficiently detailed and rigorous specification? Do we know what's supposed to happen and what we're supposed to do? It's hard to know whether we've done the right thing if we don't have a good definition of what the right thing is. So that obviously needs to be clear. Um, do we use appropriate design and test methodology? Um, are we uh, building the software in the right way? Um, are we testing it in the right way? Are we testing it enough? Um, there's a little fourth year course on the theory of testing to make sure that um, you, you know, test appropriately and you know, test things in the right way. Um, use the right programming language. Um, I, I mean, let me plug for Rust again here. Uh, that's one opportunity to prevent certain problems because you know, Rust will try to detect at compile time certain problems that other languages don't try to detect. Um, and you know, use the correct analysis tools. And this can be a performance analysis, but it could also be correctness analysis. Uh, and we talked about things like Valgrind, Helgrind, those sorts of things. So uh, I'm expecting that you know at least a little bit about some of the analysis tools. Um, and the last thing is um, verify the components and tools work the way that they say they do, right? <laughs> Trust but verify, as the saying goes. Um, because you know, it is entirely possible they tell you, oh yeah, you know, this will last for 85 years, uh, and actually it will not. Um, so yeah, no one could ever lie in marketing. Don't be silly. All right, with that said, right, um, following the appropriate design, implementation, and testing processes only make the faults less likely. Right? They cannot prevent all faults. Not all things are foreseeable. There will inevitably be things that you didn't think of or that you know, go wrong somehow. Um, and so preventing all problems is not realistic. We also have to think about um, fault tolerance. With that said, um, it is also important to resist the pressure to drop or degrade your fault prevention processes uh, when time pressure recurs. Uh, because, well, most software is actually developed under time pressure. Uh, and so if we don't do a good job of uh, holding up the uh, quality, well, it's going to lead to problems down the line. So we still need to think about fault tolerance. So let's do that. Okay, so we already know actually a few things about fault tolerance from earlier topics um, uh, in, the, in this course, um, but also a few of them were covered um, in EC252 as well. So here's the thought. Can you think of some? Okay, here's the list that I've come up with as uh, certainly not exhaustive, but um, here are some of the things we've already talked about that touch on this idea. Process isolation. Um, the most obvious example of how this is relevant is the operating system prevents one process from accessing the memory of another uh, or the memory of the operating system itself. This limits the potential damage if something goes wrong in one of the processes. You know, we um, have a bogus pointer and you know, we try to dereference that pointer. Uh, if we did not enforce the rules about memory ownership, well, that could take us anywhere and we could change anything. 
Um, and that would make the system less reliable, right? So this idea of process isolation is important for making sure that we are keeping the system functioning and other processes functioning. Dual mode operation, we talked about it in the beginning of EC252 and reviewed it again in this course. Um, and yeah, the operating system monopolizing the access to hardware devices and other common resources reduces the potential damage of a thread, maliciously or otherwise, interfering with the execution of others uh, by uh, unintentionally uh, taking all of the resources capacity or canceling other tasks, things like that. Um, preemptive priority-based scheduling is another one. Um, we, mean, we mean that misbehaving processes or threads have a limited impact uh, on other threads that want to run. Uh, without preemptive priority-based scheduling, uh, you know, rogue threads can monopolize CPU time and negatively impact other threads. Um, RAID, well, we talked about that um, in some detail in the last topic, um, so it doesn't need a whole lot of repeating at this stage. Um, but we also talked about things like checkpoints, transactions, rollback, um, parity bits, ECC, all of these things that are covered uh, in like concurrency course, um, or maybe a hardware course, maybe a databases course when you take it. Um, some of these things are just based on the idea that yeah, when things go wrong, we need a way to identify it uh, and maybe correct it or maybe retry. Um, and that is just sort of the way that it goes. Um, as for hardware failures, right, um, we learned a lot about uh, the har hardware fault tolerance in the RAID topic. Uh, we covered the idea of having backups or mirrored or striped volumes, which give us information redundancy. Um, so the loss of one copy does not result in permanent loss of data. Um, most likely you also covered uh, information redundancy in other courses around communication, checksum, parity bits, uh, error correcting codes, all of those things allow for detecting and possibly correcting errors through the use of data redundancy. Um, and so that kind of thing is information redundancy. We have more data and we use that to identify when something is wrong, if anything is wrong. And then there's physical redundancy. Uh, and physical redundancy is what happens if we have two CPU chips in the machine such that if one of them dies, then uh, the remainder of the system can carry on, uh, even if it is at a reduced capacity. Um, and that also applies in the RAID situation, um, right? That if you know, one of the hard drives dies and you have an appropriate RAID configuration, well, that's okay because you can still carry on. Your data is still there, um, even if you may need to take some steps to restore the system to full functionality. Um, but physical redundancy can also describe the idea of having more than one physical machine uh, or one in, more than one instance of your application. So that if one such instance goes down, um, even for maintenance, the other can carry on. Um, and potentially um, this physical redundancy extends to having the systems in more than one physical location so that your application can still be available even if the uh, Amazon US East One data center is offline. Um, if you've read through the AWS documentation or work with these kinds of things before, you know they have like availability zones and you know, availability zones have independent power and internet connections and stuff like that. Uh, and these are based around the idea of physical redundancy, such that if there is an outage in one plant, well, that's okay because uh, it doesn't necessarily knock out your application if you have put enough redundancy, physical redundancy into it. There's a third kind of redundancy that is worth talking about, and it is temporal redundancy. Yes, temporal as in time. Um, here, let's do a time travel joke again. Um, and this is repeating an operation when an error is detected. Uh, and that's what happens uh, if, for example, um, we look at the TCP protocol, um, network communication, when a receiver notices that a packet is missing or damaged, you request um, that this packet be resent to make sure that the data received is correct. Um, and you may also um, consider this to be that kind of redundancy when you have more than one execution of the task to verify that the results agree. Um, you can also have temporal redundancy in the sense of like, you know, sending the message multiple times to make sure you know, at least one of them <laughs> arrives. Um, it's not necessarily the optimal protocol, but it will get the job done. 
So temporal redundancy um, is actually kind of interesting, right? Um, and the space shuttle had both physical and temporal redundancy for important uh, calculations. So the space shuttle had five computers. Normally only four of them were used in a majority vote system. Um, and in such a system, um, if you know, one of the systems fails, um, it gets outvoted by the others, right? Three of them say the answer is option C, uh, and uh, one says a different option. Well, you know that the one that's uh, disagreeing with all the others is the one that's wrong. Okay. Um, if you had two systems fail in different ways, they got different answers, um, and two correct systems win the vote. Um, but if two systems fail in the same way and there's a tie, the fifth computer is activated and the fifth computer will be used as a tiebreaker in this situation. The important thing here is that such a system has no single point of failure. Um, a system which does have a single point of failure is by definition vulnerable to total failure if that one component is out of action. Um, and while it's sometimes possible to fix that sort of thing in the um, design phase, right, the deployment phase matters as well, right? Um, it's, uh, if you have two systems with multiple CPUs, redundant disks, you know, extra RAM, but they share a network connection, it's not fair to say that these are truly independent uh, systems because they have this one common component. Uh, and if the network goes down in that area, well, both systems are offline. And now what? Right? There's, there's kind of no, um, there's kind of no solution to that. So you know, the deployment has to make this work as well. Okay, but as the saying goes, now I have two problems. Um, because if we have two distinct systems that need to actually work together, we've just unlocked a whole new tier of problems that we call distributed systems problems. We actually covered one of the possible issues in distributed systems in the past when we talked about the Byzantine generals problem. That was framed around the idea of finding traitors um, when trying to complete the mission of the emperor. But there's lots of other things that fall under this category. Many of them are not as much fun as you know, the emperor commanding his legions of troops to attack and trying to figure out how to best you know, carry out the will of the emperor and all of that. Um, but all of these things fall under this umbrella. I want to introduce one uh, such problem in detail. Uh, and the problem that we'll discuss is about clock synchronization. What is clock synchronization? Well, it's the idea of do we agree on what time it is? And the truth of the matter is it is not trivial to get two independent systems to agree on what the current time is. Right? Um, the idea of temporal redundancy introduces this problem of time. Um, and I mean, if you've studied sort of the, the physics behind this and you know, the theory and all of that, like and how does time, how does time actually get defined? Um, you will very quickly come across the, um, the fundamental thing that says the universal reference clock is the definitive source of what is the current time on the planet Earth. Okay, so any clock that is not the universal reference clock will be off by some amount. It's just a question of how much, All right? Um, any other clock is by definition wrong. It's just a question of you know, how wrong is it and how much are you willing to tolerate, right? It's easy to imagine lots of scenarios where independent systems that don't agree on what time it is misbehave. Um, if the primary system is supposed to take some action at exactly eight o'clock and this action takes half a second to complete and it should signal its completion, uh, and should this action not be completed within one second, a backup system is going to take over. Um, well, now we have a problem, right? If those two systems, uh, if their clocks disagree by one second, um, the backup system is going to take an action unnecessarily and perhaps cause an error by doing so. Like maybe the action should not be repeated um, or maybe it's just a waste of time, right? Is that example a little bit silly? Maybe, um, but if you've ever been in a video call with delay and it's very frustrating because you each keep talking over one another, you know, interrupting and you know, talking over each other, you know, you go ahead, no, you go ahead, um, and you know, I'll wait, and uh, it's pretty miserable, right? And uh, I think everybody had more experience with that than they would like in the, in the past few years. Um, but inevitably, right, that is a frustrating experience. 
and you've experienced the pain of what happens when we don't agree on what time it is. Um, and it's just noticeable in like a video call because there's sort of a natural rhythm to conversation, um, which is partly like cultural, um, but it is like harder to tell when somebody has finished speaking um, or when it's your turn, or when you can change the topic, when there is this lag, because it is hard to know, did they actually finish? Uh, or is it just the lag? Um, you know, and when you want to start, did somebody else want to jump in? The other thing that I want to say is that time zones actually matter, right? And I, I recommend using for uh, you know coordinating these sorts of systems UTC um, because it doesn't have weird things like daylight savings time. Because daylight savings time results in weird behavior like time jumping back and forth, right? Um, jumping forward is strange enough. Um, but jumping back is worse because it can mean that like a certain minute of the day happens more than one time and that tends to defeat our expectation of linear time um, and that can really be a problem if an action that is supposed to be taken once per day happens two times or is skipped entirely right um, utc also avoids issues where you know the california system thinks it's monday and the singapore team thinks it's tuesday but on the other hand um, utc isn't perfect um, you know, if your application is a Mars rover, um, well, it's not on Earth, so using Earth time maybe doesn't make sense. Um, so maybe the best thing is star dates. You know, Captain's log, star date 46119.1. We'll see. Okay. Um, but UTC digression aside, right? Clocks frequently use quartz for synchronization. Um, and quartz is a rock, honestly. Uh, sorry, it's a mineral, Marie. Um, and it vibrates at a certain frequency. And basically, you can count the number of times it vibrates to get a reasonable estimate for how long a second is. Thing is, there's always drift and measurement error. Um, and a quartz-based clock will typically vary by approximately half a second per day. Um, so the idea of the two systems being off by one full second uh, that I opened this topic with is plausible, right? It's, it's reasonable. Just imagine system A uh, is fast by half a second and system B is slow by half a second. Uh, and there you go, we have one full second of difference between them. So, okay. Um, in a non-real-time system, um, you can just change the clock to the correct time and you just jump there. Um, that seems a little bit weird, but it is doable. Um, I remember doing this one time on my laptop. Uh, I was changing the time zone or whatever, and it caused the screen to lock because uh, the screen um, timeout check uh, had a, a very different idea of what time it was after I adjusted the clock by an hour. Like, it happens, right? Um, it was funny, um, and like I understood immediately why it was uh, you know, locking the screen from inactivity, um, but it did, uh, it did confuse the computer a little bit. But for a real-time system, we usually don't want to do that. We usually do not like the idea of uh, breaking the expectation of linear time because it can cause things to happen uh, more than it should, um, so we usually don't do that. The solutions are effectively a gradual speed up or slow down of the clock. So you count a second as a little longer or a little shorter until things are back in sync. But what is the destination that we're going to? How do we know sort of what is the time that we're trying to get to? How much should we slow down or speed up to get there? Interesting question, right? So a possible solution for this is something like the network time protocol. Um, and this is more complicated than we actually want to discuss here in this topic as time sort of runs short. Uh, but a possible solution it looks like this. There is a reference source that you can query um, with the network time protocol. Um, and the protocol itself is designed to compensate for some but not all forms of network delay. Um, and effectively, I think you should take away from this that it is not possible to try to get all systems to agree or even two systems to agree on exactly what time it is. That's okay as long as you build your system to acknowledge the fact that you know, clock times will not be identical. Um, and this does mean that yeah, sometimes you know, messages appear to arrive before they're sent. 
right? You know, we have one second difference or half a second difference, and you know, so the send time uh, of the message is somehow ahead of the receive time of the message, like you know, further in the future. That seems weird. You know, the message didn't travel back through time. We just don't agree on what time it is. So building your system um, to accommodate this is better. Anyway, all of this is just like a very simple overview of some of the issues uh, that might arise when we have multiple systems for redundancy. The whole idea of distributed systems is sufficiently complicated that there is a whole fourth year technical elective. And yes, if you can believe it, I'm actually plugging a technical elective that isn't the EC4591. Um, but this one is EC454. Um, and uh, it is, well, a distributed systems course. Uh, and I certainly think it's worthwhile um, because so many systems that we deal with now are distributed, at least in some way. Uh, and so there's lots of different and interesting things to consider when we talk about such a system. But that's where we're going to leave it for now. Um, and if you uh, take an interest in this particular topic, then yeah, I do encourage you to take that uh, fourth year elective.